Albert Lee Seed is proud to support the Back to the Roots podcast. Like you, they value the one-on-one conversations with farmers and other agricultural professionals that you hear on this show. Albert Lee Seed helps organic and transitional farms with a full line of organic and non-GMO farm seed for corn, soybeans, forage and pasture, cover crops, and cereal grains. Check them out at alseed.com. That's alseed.com. You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. This is Brian Wood, and today we're in Milwaukee, Indiana, with Joel Mecklenburg, who is an organic grain grower, um, and we're going to sit down and just kind of talk about the background of the farm and what he's up to these days. So thanks, Joel, for being on, and can you give us a little background of your farm? Absolutely. My name's Joel, and I'm uh, proud to call myself a farmer here. Um, grew up always doing things different. I grew up on a vegetable farm. 40 acres of pretty much every imaginable crop you can think of, okra, collard greens, beets, herbs, tomatoes, melons. Um, We also had 40 acres of sweet corn, 40 acres of pumpkins, and we did farmer's markets. So that's kind of a different offshoot to agriculture just to grow up with. So like I said, I'm used to being different. So organic fits well with that. I ended up moving here to Indiana out of Illinois, and I just want to be different. I don't feel the the health is really in the GMOs and all the chemicals that farmers spray, so I just choose on my own to uh, go a different direction the way that I really feel nature wants it to be. So that's why I've settled on growing primarily soybeans, wheat, seed corn, occasional corn, uh, putting hay out now into the rotation to broaden the rotation spectrum. I've worked with hemp in the past and I do a lot of cover cropping. So how many acres do you run total here? Roughly 1,200 we're at right now. Okay, and is that all organic or are you transition? If it's not organic, I don't want to farm it. Sure. So it's either organic or transition, so okay. both. So how long have you been uh, working towards everything being organic? I figured you were going to ask me that, and I was actually scratching my head on that earlier. I think it was 2011, um, so roughly nine nine years, I would think. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you said you grew up on a vegetable farm in Illinois. Uh, that was probably a conventional uh, vegetable farm? It was, yep. That's correct. And then you moved to Indiana, and was did you have a history of grain farming growing up, or did you just kind of learn <laughs> as you went? My Both my grandparents have always been farmers as well. My mother's, my grandpa on my mother's side was a really large-scale grain farmer. Strictly corn, strictly beans, that's it. Corn and beans, nothing else. So I got the input from, you know, the large ag, the big equipment, the black smoke, the fun power. And um, then I got the specialized hands-on experience with uh, the home vegetable farm and and FFA doing record books and keeping track. I I did a lot of specialty crops, and that's what I kept my record books on. So that helps with certifying organic, too. I would definitely recommend going to FFA and having a record book because paperwork's where it's at, really. Um... And then we also had a livestock operation when I was 13. I really wanted to have a cow-calf operation, so I fenced in a 14-acre pasture by hand. And, boy, I still remember in Illinois digging. I dug all the post holes by hand just because, I guess because I'm nuts. But (laughs) I still remember I never saw a single stone, and I never saw anything other than pure black dirt, just black as night. And then you move to Indiana, and some fields you get to, you just scratch your head. And it's just like little tiny gravel and a little bit of organic matter. And that's like, where's all the topsoil? <laughs> and I don't understand why, you know, urban sprawl happens in some of the better farmland in the world. And then uh, I think Chicago should just move to the Sonoran Desert or something. <laughs> and we can farm <laughs> Chicago because that's built on black soil too. That that black soil that in, in Illinois, like... In Ohio, we have we have good soil. Don't get me wrong, but like that post hole and black, I can't I can't imagine not hitting something with a digger down there. Sure, don't remember it. I yeah. pretty certain I never did. At least at least four foot. You know, being a young boy, I might want to say I dug five foot deep, but <laughs> I know I put those eight foot posts four foot. Up. Eh, that's somewhere in there. But man, I just never remember seeing anything other than just pure blackness. And here, that just doesn't exist. 
Mm -hmm. So this year, what are you? Is there a company you raise seed corn for? I raise for Grow Alliance. Grow Alliance, which is subcontracted from all the larger organic seed companies. So I never really know what 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 variety or what end user I'm raising for. So I just do the best I can for the guys that I work with. So they're responsible for placing the seed on the ground, and then I'm responsible to plant, fertilize, control weeds. Then once again, then they come back, and they're responsible for all detasseling and mail road destruction and harvest. And then once it's harvested, it leaves the farm, and then, then it's completely in their hands. So they dry it. They husk it, sort it, dry it, shell it, process it, bag it, and store it until it's for shipment. So Did you say they do the detasseling? Correct. Okay. Yep. They have... What they do for detasseling is they'll come through once it's ready to shoot a tassel up with basically lawnmower blades with electric eyes on it, and they just cut the very top of the plant off. And that's not detasseling, that's cutting. So then you'll have three days of growth, and since they cut the leaves off, then all that grows out of the top of the plant is just a pure tassel. And then you'll see them come through with these really interesting units also with electric eyes on it that's just two little tires moving in opposite directions, and the, the tassel gets pinched between them and just pulls right out. And then they bring crews the hired hands in to get anything that the equipment lost. And oftentimes they'll walk a field two if not three times just to make sure they get every single tassel out of the way. So that's why there's porta potties by all the corn seed fields? That is why, yes. We've solved the mystery. <laughs> I was looking at that today and my age year old was like, what? are they building something? Why are there porta potties in all these fields? So if what the machine doesn't get workers go through and make sure that every tassel is pulled i really find it interesting that you drive through the countryside and what you focus on is toilets <laughs> <laughs> well no i was actually focusing more on the seed corn production because it's such a new world for me i know nothing about it that's how you get hybrid vigor it's two inbred lines being crossed and that's that's how why that's why they call corn being a hybrid it's a cross of two different parent stocks mm -hmm. so there's so can you walk through the process of of basically going from planting what you do for fertility and then why those uh it needs to be detasseled why there's a male row why they take that down um can you walk through that yeah, that's a mouthful well fertility i really take a lot of pride in growing cover crops good enough that i can supply my own nitrogen i always supplement it with chicken litter as well um so to get the so so clover would only give you the N and some of the trace minerals in it, perhaps. And I like that that's a slow breakdown. I terminate that with a mallboard plow, so it releases as the soil warms up. So I'd say the majority of the nitrogen is released in late June, July, August, perhaps. And I feel that's when the corn crop needs it the most. Um, I put a lot of, lot of uh, stuff through my 2x2 two two on my planter. So while I'm planting, now with planting, if you use a 16-year-old planter, most seed corn is raised on a 4-1 rotation. That's why you'll see four rows of shorter corn, then one row with a tassel on it, then four. The tassel is the male portion of the plant, so that's the male crop. And that's why the females don't have any tassels, so they only have the silks. Um, but I, I fertilize all 16 rows at the same time. And then typically it takes three passes to plant seed corn. It depends on the varieties. Sometimes it might get down to one pass, but often it's probably three passes first class being female and it seems more often than not it's like a 60 heat unit delay um, so they base it not just when the sun comes up and goes down but also how much sunlight there is and what the temperature is in the day versus the night and so you'll plant female say on monday and perhaps by thursday morning they'll want you to plant first male which means you'll plant row one row six row 11 and row 16. Um, and then oftentimes maybe three or four days later they'll have you plant it again so that male row will get planted twice. For what purpose? More population, more okay. pollen, the better chance. I see. Okay. Okay. That's fertilizer. What was the next question? Well, right. What do you run through the planter? A lot of fish guts. I really, I was really excited about liquefying chickens. That was, that was a big deal to me here. <laughs> last, <laughs> last two winters, actually. As soon as farming gets over... Man, I was all about just grinding up chickens and trying to pump them through my planter. And I really honestly figured it out. I figured it out so much that I went to an auction. I bought 30 tanks, 30 2,500-gallon pallet tanks, 
And like I had it figured, like it was gonna like if you think about feathers on a chicken, I'm pretty sure there's 19 pounds of nitrogen in chicken feathers, and like the blood that comes out of a chicken, that's really high in protein. And the higher the protein is, the higher there's a correlation. I don't know the ratio, but uh, you know, chicken like layer hens, they still have meat on them, and feathers, meat, and blood. That's some good nitrogens, but you can't pump it through a hose and you can't make it stable. But if you manipulate the pH enough on it, uh, it makes it stable and it also slowly digests it. Where you can, it literally turns to liquid. I have samples around here if you want to see some. I'll even let you smell it. No, I, I'm good on the smelling portion. <laughs> so, um, otherwise, uh, since that, I couldn't get my certifier to actually approve it to be organic. So that's kind of on a pause right now. But uh, I've been using fish hydrolysate, not emulsion, but hydrolysate, um, some molasses. Oh, I have it all written down. Uh, my m memory doesn't serve me properly. Uh, there's about seven or eight different items I put in, and then I'll pump roughly 40 gallons an acre on with my corn planter on first planting. Mm -hmm. And then is this on irrigated ground? On everything. That, that all okay. goes on to corn ground. A majority yeah. of my ground is irrigated, but I do it for non-irrigated as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you run any fertilizers through your irrigation? I have the ability to, but I have not since I've been organic. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what I'd, I could put some fish through it, but it's going to be at such a low percentage. And the volume of water it takes to, to actually distribute that properly, I'd, I'm afraid I'd wash it all off. Foliar feed, does. I think that would need to sit on the leaves and actually absorb through it. They say, um, I was talking to Todd Zare, who was a guest earlier with us, uh, who owns Soil Biotics, and he said, I think it was, was that 20 or 30 minutes, the plant will have 90 plus percent of it absorbed. But if you think about an irrigation system putting down half an inch mm -hmm. in a 14 hours, it takes to do 180 degrees. So that's pretty much like a monsoon over the course of 10 minutes, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll probably hold off on chemigation mm -hmm. or fertigation right now. Mm -hmm. So on now the seed corn, you've got it planted. Do you rotary hoe? Oh, like crazy. Yeah, I this year I rotary hoed my crop four times before it ever emerged out of the ground. And I have I have five fields of seed corn this season, and I'm so proud of four of them. Like they're just I'm I don't think I'd change too much about them. But then it seems like when you're organic, you always have so many things you're proud of, typically in the back of a field where nobody sees it. But then the field up by the main road that everybody sees, it's always kind of like a big red thumb sticking out. And it's, yeah, it's no matter what, uh, if you're organic, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I have things I'd be proud to show, put on the front of a paper, and then I have one that I just wish I could close my eyes to right now. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to give up, so... Uh, quitting isn't an option, so you just have to adapt and overcome and improve it for next year. Mm -hmm. Now, how many times do you cultivate then? Three. Three. The first two, um, I like to, I have a higher speed, uh, high residue henniker cultivator. So uh, the first time, I like to do it when the weeds are two inches or less. Because if you're used to a henniker, it's just two blades with a point and it. It doesn't really stir the ground. It's almost like a tidal wave going underneath your soil and it picks the top inch of your ground up. And you can just sit in the tractor looking out your back window and watch it happen. The grass just goes up an inch and sets right back down. And then you scratch your head and think, well, I missed it. But then you'll doubt yourself, so you'll get out and you'll pull it up and you'll see it cut underneath all the roots. And then by the time you do a round and look back at it, then you can see that that exact 23 inch pass in that row is all wilted down. So as long as you don't get a rain in the first day or so, it seems to work pretty good. And then once again, if the weeds, the weeds are two inches tall, by that time the corn really should be hopefully nine to 10 inches tall by that second pass. That'd be the second cultivation. Then the third pass happens when the corn gets to be, I like to do it as close to the bottom of the tractor as possible so I can still get through the field. But that's when I like to put ridging wings on and try to throw as much dirt in the row as possible to cover up any smaller weeds that I can. Mm -hmm. And that's still with the Heinegger three yep. passes with the same cultivator? Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. Not the same same model. Same um, model. But yeah. One set up to do cover crop seeding, and I usually keep the ridging wings on that one. And the other one's more set up to be fine-tuned for smaller crops with shields on it and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then after the third cultivation, you are done with that until uh, harvest? Hand weeding usually comes into play in that area, trying to get the final weeds out of it. Um, always crop inspecting. Uh, 
I guess the equipment wise, personally, I would be done. That'd still mm -hmm. be it. Uh, organic insecticide and organic fungicide pass a week before detasseling and then a second one a week after detasseling um, which I would be responsible whether I use a aerial applicator or a, a ground application but I am responsible for that too okay is that required by the seed corn grower that you do it this is. yeah yeah what what are they worried about uh, what would seed corn be susceptible to that well they use diapel I hope this is an industry secret, so forgive me if it is. But they use Diapel, which Diapel, I spray that on my, I have some cauliflower and some Brussels sprouts just to play around with. And you know those little yellow and white butterflies you see? Mm -hmm. They lay all the eggs. Mm -hmm. it, it kills any worm that eats it. it. Well, they use that for their army worms were real bad in this yep, area. Yep, we and use that on army worm. Diapel. And I think maybe cutworm and earworm or those things. So that's what Diapel is for. And then Sonata, they, there's Sonata, Regalia, Amplitude, and... I think they have a new one out too. Uh, we personally use Sonata, and that is to help control the fungus. So it's it's like a organic fungicide. It's somewhat weak. I've tr attempted to use it on uh, my weed as well. So I've tried Sonata and Regalia at flag leaf, um, well, at, at flowering in wheat. And it seems to have some positive results, but I still have yet to see if it's worth the expense or not. Mm-hmm. So from the sounds of it, with the amount of fertilizer, with the amount of weed passes or cultivation passes with the fungicide, herbicide, uh, or insecticide, um, seed corn's pretty susceptible, or is a pretty, needs to be babied, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, it's it's a weak plant. It's nothing like hybrid corn. But that's what your goal is, is to produce your yeah. hybrid corn. Yep, this okay. is how hybrid corn is And you're using the parent. Okay, okay. Yeah. It, it doesn't take a rotary hoe like the hybrid corn would. It, it snaps off more than than, than just takes it. Um, tine weeding, I've had some really hard times tine weeding it, where, once again, hybrid shell corn will take it, where seed corn won't. And It's just you got to treat it with little gloves on your hands, I guess, and just realize it's a weak plant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What is the yield uh, per acre then on seed corn? Oh, the yields, you know, that's a great question because they mow down 20% of your field because you don't harvest the male. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if they base it off of just the 80% left over or your whole area. And we're required to have 330-foot buffer zones between organic, the first organic female ta or female silk versus your neighbor's GMO or any corn for that matter, GMO corn tassel. So there has to be 330 foot. If it's popcorn or sweet corn, then you have to have a quarter mile. So that's tough stuff. Wow. Yeah. Um, I have one field that has a neighbor, actually I have two seed corn fields, and one neighbor's really awesome. He gave me permission to just, his. he was a farmer, he knew his sweet corn was tasseled and that it was already pollinated, so he allowed me to go in with snippers and just snip his tassels off just to keep everybody happy in the whole system. Because it's not just the guys I grow for personally, it's also the end users come out to the field and inspect it throughout the season too. So um, there's a lot of people that kind of keep an eye on seed corn fields. But there's another neighbor that we knew he was planting a couple rows of sweet corn, probably an eighth of a mile away. And we had to plant, take part of the field and plant an additional 16 rows of mail around both sides of that field just because of those two rows of sweet corn. That's And this would just be backyard Sweet corn. Yeah, just growing it for your <laughs> evening dinner. Oh, my. You know, up in up in LaGrange and Howe and, like, you know, that's the seed corn capital of the world. I, a lot of farmers will pick a spot and just plant two acres of sweet corn themselves and invite all their neighbors around. Like, hey, I raised it. I fertilized it. I, I killed the bugs in it. It's perfect sweet corn. Have it. You're allowed to get this much. Just take it. And a lot of them do that. Or other farmers, uh, big sweet seed corn farmers will go to the clear spring auction and buy a whole tote of like a pallet sized tote and they'll just have a delivery route and they'll just go to all their neighbors and say hey here's a couple dozen see you next week <laughs> so if if you're like me loving to grow sweet corn in your garden you can really screw up your neighbors who are raising seed corn just by planting half a pound of sweet corn you got it buddy hope we can stay friends <laughs> Well, luckily there's no seed. Well, I don't think there are any seed corn growers in my neighborhood. Well, I'm pretty sure you're more than a half mile away from me, so yeah, we'll be all right. I think I'm good. Uh, 
But I, I guess I just didn't have any idea that it would took multiple plantings and like all the process because you, you see a field of seed corn and you're like, oh my goodness, that looks sad. Like when you're used to, you know, trying to shoot for 30 ton or 250 bushels an acre, you know, you're looking for that hybrid vigor, but you see a field of seed corn and it's like, oh. So the plant itself is much weaker than the hybrid. Hands down, yes. Yep. And it applies to livestock as well. Mm -hmm. um, crossing two parent stocks will often have better producing offspring. So That first cross. Yep. Hey, now mm -hmm. we're talking. Going back to college days here. Mm -hmm. um, what was I going to say? I was going to say something. Oh, you asked about seed corn yields. Oh, so, yeah. you know, everybody dreams of 200 bushel corn. I guess conventional guys might even want to surpass that now. But uh, 200 bushel corn, I'd smile pretty good if I could combine that organically. And I would say 70 bushel seed corn end result, I'm, that's probably achievable and uh, that's a good correlation. 200 bushel shell corn would probably equal 65 to 70 bushel seed corn. Mm -hmm. And when they harvest that, they're taking the whole husk and yep. everything off. Yep. And what is the reason for that? How come It protects they the that? kernels. Each kernel is valuable. So the more husk around it and... And then they they husk it yeah. and shell it. A seed corn company basically takes a combine, takes every individual part apart, and spreads it across the county. <laughs> so they put part of the combine in the field, and they truck most of the crop back to the plant, and then and then it yeah, it's it's really fun to watch it. Well, where I live up in southern Michigan, there's a lot of seed corn growing, and I see it done, but I don't ever really understand what's going on yep. and i've never been able to ask so so the the combine the harvester would be similar to a sweet corn harvester yeah they use the same picker uh, oxbow that uh, okay they they can harvest the same it's crop basically it. just snapping rolls it's a corn head a with a belt conveyor behind it okay so there's no there's no thrashing system on it at all mm -hmm. it seriously goes through the snap rolls so it sucks the stalk down snaps the ear off goes into a conveyor and goes into a dump cart which goes into a truck and then, then the center part of the combine where it would roll the husk off is one unit, which is a husking bed. And then it falls into a whole bunch of series of belt conveyors where it's inspected by so many people just visually. And they'll find an ear that doesn't match or they might see a cob that's red and the rest of it's supposed to be a white cob. Or uh, It's pretty obvious when something's really different. And they just throw that in the, the husklage line. And that's at the plant you're talking. Yeah, that's at the plant. Yeah. And then after visual inspection, that goes into belt conveyors and it goes to these great big square buildings that are, have vented floors on the bottom on an angle and just huge fans and so much propane blowing warm air through it. And they don't want to get it too hot. They're very particular on, on how they dry it because it hurts the germination of it. I don't know how they, I don't know the exact temperatures or anything. I just know they pay a lot of attention to that. And then it'll come out of that and go into a whole bunch more belt conveyors and they'll go up to the thresher, which is on the top of a building, and that's where the dry shell corn gets shelled off of the cob. Then they have trailers for corn cobs that go to one place, then then all the shell corn goes in the bin, and then the documentation, uh, it's, it's pretty intense. There's a lot of paperwork that goes into that too, and just documenting where everything came from and what lot number it is. And But it gets, it gets husked. Right from the field to the husker. Yep. It gets okay. picked, it gets trucked, and it gets husked all within two hours. So probably in two hours it would be sitting inside of a bin with warm air blowing on it. And what what moisture are they uh, It seems like they like to shoot around mid-30s, mid to low 30s. If you get it too dry, it seems it drops on something so many times. When it goes through the husker and drops in a dump cart, dump cart to semi, semi to floor, floor to belt conveyor. And then that husker is really aggressive, too. So the drier it is, the more kernels you lose off the tip or the, the butt of the ear. So I really feel they like it around in the mid-30s. I've seen it harvested up to low 40s before, but that's getting a little bit milky yet. Mm -hmm. So they want to save the little medium rounds on the end. It's, we already grew it. Might as well put it in a bag. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> that, that is, that's intriguing to me. Now I really want to, I'm going to have to go on YouTube tonight and, watch some i'll give you a tour if you ever want to come back starts here in one week harvest starts <laughs> well, we're a week August early yeah, okay. mm -hmm. so you mentioned earlier when we were talking that you also raised hemp 
I did. I raised hemp last year, and I really enjoyed it. I had the best and the worst situations possible, so uh, I guess I'll talk about whichever one you want. Both. Okay. Because sometimes I think other farmers that are listening will learn more from people's mistakes than they will from your successes. Mm-hmm. So, And we're really hoping we can help people. So I want to hear both. Okay. Well, I have one field in particular that I treated exactly the same. And I guess I sort of messed up from the beginning because they wanted me to plant. The company I raised for recommended I planted in seven and a half inch rows. And that doesn't really work good for me because I don't know how to cultivate seven and a half inch rows. <laughs> and hemp is kind of weak when it grows. It doesn't take a rotary hoeing. Like it's supposed to be like a stalk of iron sticking them out of the ground and grow twice as weed as any competing weed, uh, twice as fast as any competing weed. And uh, it's just not true. It grows pretty fast once it's going into reproductive stage. When that final stem comes out the top, it really shoots up quick then. But it it struggles to compete. So I wanted to cultivate it, and I planted 30-inch rows. I used a 15-inch drill and duct-taped every other hole shut. So I just made my own 8-row 30-inch planter. And I planted it, and then I tried rotary hoeing it at one spot, and it just didn't take it. I attempted to tine weed it, and it's just really weak when it's young. And I got to cultivate it a few times, so I kept the weed control in the center of the rows and it, it definitely likes sand a little bit better than than the the wetter soil so I think it likes dry feet but so in the same field I had two different sections and it ranged from one of the best organic grain hemp fields a few agronomists have ever seen down to a field that I ended up just disking up just out of complete failure and I really scratched my head on that for a while. I had a field day here last year, and there was a lot of guests that came out, and I was so proud that they came out. And I planted this hemp field up front because I wanted to show them seed corn, and right across the road I could show them how to interseed clover into double crop beans, and then we could talk about hemp. So I had a three different stage stop all within 300 feet. So I had it all figured out. And wouldn't you know, the field that's on the the field day that they were going to walk and see It's just a disaster, and I was kind of heartbroke over it, but it is what it is. And then it finally dawned on me. I realized what happened, and hemp is so sensitive to any chemical in the air. And living in the grain belt where there's a lot of conventional farmers, it's just tough to make it work. So uh, the field up by the road, I feel, got contaminated with atrazine or Roundup or something. There's a conventional field directly across the road on the south side, And I think the chemical just drifted in, and and it didn't completely kill it, but it stunted it enough, and it didn't seem to affect the weeds, that the weeds just took off like crazy, and then the hemp couldn't compete. And then the exact same field on the far north protected northeast corner of my farm, uh, everything, all conditions the exact same, minus the neighboring chemical, was one of the best fields I've I've seen and some of the the other experts have ever seen. So I really think chemical drift is huge. Mm Mm-hmm. How do you harvest that? You combine it like wheat. Oh, really? And there's three different ways. There's fiber hemp, but I think that's primarily down by Kentucky because it takes a special processing plant, mm-hmm. and that's where it takes the lignin out, and I guess you can build two-by-fours out of it in houses. <laughs> um, then there's grain hemp, which I believe goes, that's what I grew, I believe it gets pressed into oil, and then it gets sold through health food stores. Mm-hmm. Then there's the CBD, which I don't really understand that, which every time somebody hears that I raised hemp, it instantly must have been CBD. Um, So I guess grain farming must be a smaller sector, or maybe it's just not as publicized, but Mm CBD is apparently where all the money's at, but boy, I know a lot of people that really got hurt on that, so I I don't have any interest in raising CBD. Mm -hmm. Are you raising any hemp this year? I had a really good parcel picked out for it, but unfortunately, last minute, I kind of found out that a couple of the people that live close to the parcel I wanted to plant to aren't the most reputable people and I didn't want to have a, a hemp crop behind their house so no <laughs> I, I have seed for it and I hope it overwinters because I'd like to grow it next year yet but it just the uh, the stars didn't align for this season mm-hmm. well, I think CBD hemp is well first of all a different variety and then it's a lot more uh labor Hand oh, labor, yeah. uh, you know, you're hand planting, you're starting seeds in a greenhouse, then hand planting them, mm. hand weeding. You're doing a lot of, it's like growing a vegetable crop. Is I've, pretty much I've heard that you can make like a 
10,000 bucks an acre, which sounds really appealing. So why don't we just go out and plant 200 acres of it and just work once every five years. But, uh, I think the maximum one person can do by themselves is two acres, isn't it? In Indiana, you got to get a permit and I don't know if they have an acreage limit, but I know it's the total amount of acres in the state of Indiana is, is capped. So I think hmm. it's, depends on who puts in the uh, certification or whatever and you that's have, just for cbd hemp yeah i think so the I, grain hemp there's no limits I, on it don't quote me on that i'm not 100 okay. percent sure i was the one of the groups i work with was looking at potentially doing like a half an acre of cbd and they were trying to put in an application or wondering if they should and that's where i learned all this stuff so as far as the grain side i know on the cbd side it was all um, you know, you have to test it for THC and it's got to be below a certain percentage of THC and the CBD and so on and so forth. So it's really highly controlled. The state chemist office is in charge of it. So everybody listening that has questions should all call the state chemist office at the exact same time right now and see if their phone blows up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the state of Indiana. There, so Correct, there yeah. might be other states that do it. I assume different. every state has its chemist office, though. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. So make a phone call. <laughs> Uh, now going into your other crop, which is your wheat and then double cropping beans. Now, you, do you also raise beans just one long crop one, you know, not double cropping? Not normally. I might if it's a transition area around seed corn to control pollen shed. But primarily my full season beans are only on, on transitional ground. Okay. Once it's organic, um, I like to do double crop beans so I can interseed my clover and get the three crop rotation in the same year. Mm-hmm. And the reason you're going for a three crop rotation is ultimately it breaks up the weed cycle. At least I've always thought, but this year it just didn't seem to work. So I'm really left scratching my head. So I didn't really want to do it, but at the same time, I think it needs to be done. And I'm going to put some hay back into my rotation for a two year crop and then see if that busts the weed cycle up even better yet. And that ultimately would take the place of my clover because one of the main reasons for clover is to build nitrogen. So hay should be able to have the same potential red clover does and be harvested for a couple years in between. Mm-hmm. So it seems like everything's always changing. You think you might have one thing figured out, and then you wake up the next morning, and it just doesn't work. So It's farming. Adapt and overcome, right? <laughs> now, do you go in with wheat after corn? Yeah, as fast as you can, yeah. Thankfully, seed corn comes out fairly early. Being that they harvested in the 30s on moisture, it oftentimes comes out October 1st, say, And uh, as long as you can get wheat, I like to get wheat out by October 7th. So there's one week of busy season. That's the thing about trying to like intensive crop. It's like such a huge workload all jammed into as few days as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's just sleep and then go, 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 go for a few days and then just go to your crash and hopefully you're done before you crash. (laughs) Now is your, that's a, is that a red winter wheat? Soft red winter. Soft red winter. Now, do you try to use a shorter season wheat? I do. So you can get your beans out quicker? Yep. I intended to dry my wheat this year, too, just so I can get my beans out even quicker. I think the statistic is every day in the beginning of July that you delay planting soybeans costs you half a bushel an acre. So if you can get 20 bucks for organic soybeans, it's $10 a day for every acre you don't plant. If you can shave seven days off of that, that's 70 bucks. If Mm -hmm. you do 400 acres, it's... You can buy a decent little beat up truck yeah. for that. And do you do tillage after the wheat or you always? You know? mm-hmm. Wheat does a great job of controlling weeds and even if it didn't, you get to harvest at the end of June. And I don't know too many weeds that actually go to seed by the end of June. So even if it's a disaster, which it hasn't been as of yet, uh, you still get to go in and combine your field and start over from square one. And I've always told people that nature just has a different pull on weed seed germination come July 1st. Like in May, it seems like every seed in the ground is just dying to grow and grow fast and strong. Beep, beep. And <laughs> come come July, it seems like, I don't know if it's the day length, if, if weed seeds germinate off of like the photo period, but... Up until this year, I stand corrected because this year just didn't seem to work, but I've always had less weed pressure in double crop beans. Mm -hmm. You'll still get some foxtail, you'll still get lamb's quarter and pigweed, but you won't get the enormous flush that you do typically with first season. Mm 
What kind of tillage do you do following wheat? I have a high speed disc. Okay. The faster you pull it, the better it does. So um, don't bail your straw, just chop it, blow it on the ground and chase after the combine in the field with the high speed disc and then chase after the disc with the drill and, or the corn plant, the bean planter rather. But yeah, it's, it's like follow the leader. <laughs> mm-hmm. And what, what is your yield on your double crop beans then? Anywhere from 30, t- I want to say that my lowest was 32 so far. So for the last five years that I can remember of, I've had the lowest being 32 bushel an acre and the highest being 44. Um, and then now this year I've already dissed up one field because I can just see it's not going to make it. And I'm still scratching my head why. I planted one day earlier than I did last season. I planted the same variety of bean and the same type of soil and the same tillage equipment and and irrigated it, kept it wet. If you water your beans uh, right after the planter goes, and you have to plant... Uh, start the field based on starting the pivot so you get to kind of race planting based on where the pivot's at you put a half inch on and turn it on once you get your first round done then your goal is to just keep planting in front of the pivot and 24 hours later once you're done and the pivot shut off go back to where you started watering and you'll have a quarter inch sprout on your bean already like in july beans just grow like crazy once again, until this year, don't know why, but something happened, and I, I wish I could figure it out. I have a lot higher weed pressure in double crop beans, and I just didn't seem to have the germination that I wanted. I, I'm not used to this. Something's different. Mm-hmm. So did you disc that up and go new hay seeding yep. in it? Yep. So I had yeah the field here by the house. That's why it's all dissed up. I'm getting ready to go spread some sulfur on it and then work it again and get it leveled off and pray for the best. Mm-hmm. Are you going heavy alfalfa or clovers? What are you planting? Uh, alfalfa. And there's a debate out there that you can go anywhere from 12 pounds, and I hear some people going up to like 44 pounds. Actually, I had heard one guy go to 50 pounds of alfalfa seed per acre. So being organic, I don't really know what to do. So I've kind of decided to float around that 20-pound an acre range, and I'm going to uh, work my ground nice and level, then blow the seed on top and use a really big heavy roller to hopefully – not only press the alfalfa seed into the ground and make a good firm seed bed, but also if there's any rocks that I missed with the rock picking that I'll shove them in the ground so the hay mower doesn't hit them. So that should also give a, a nice flat piece of ground to do some high speed mowing on. Mm-hmm. And what will you use that hay for? Good question. I don't know. Probably, probably organic valley dairies in the area. And, you know, I like thinking. So I'm thinking, I've heard people say that dairy cows make more milk off baleage and haylage and silage. So why don't I just make baleage? So I found a baler, and it's a round baler, but it comes out of the chamber and it never touches the soil. It just instantly goes into a plastic wrapping station. It's a Claws 446 Mm -hmm. Unirap, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be neat because I could, I'm a night owl, so I could start mowing a field. And with HID lights, you can just run all night. So you start mowing at 9. By the time the sun comes up, the whole field's down. So the sun comes up, and I feel that the field would dry evenly then because it'll all get the same amount of sunlight and let it set for one day. And then the next night goes through, sun comes up, eat lunch, go out, merge it, and bale it and wrap it. So you could have hay made in a day and a half. Mm -hmm. I think you'd find a lot of windows where it's not raining. And in theory, I think dairy cows would make more milk because... I, I won't be able to sell organic hay to a horse. I don't think anybody would want to buy it. Mm-hmm. And mm. and I think that's where, you know, the saying baleage makes more milk is because you have a much better chance of getting that right window to make it at the right time. Where if you want to dry it, you're looking at you need at least a three-day window. If you get a heavy stand, three days might not cut it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so baleage, you can do it in a day and a half, two days, and you well, this have. this year we had windows for dry first cutting, which mm-hmm. I don't remember having yeah, that in years. It's been a lucky year. But so, I, I really don't think with where you're located here with all the farms in the area, if you make high-quality baleage, I guarantee you'll be able to sell it. I'm hoping to – I don't know if I'd sell it based on, obviously, moisture content. You have to sell it on a dry matter basis. But I should also be able to correlate like RFV or RFQ into it. And I would think baleage would naturally have a higher RF – RFV value. Mm-hmm. Are um, you going straight alfalfa or are you putting a grass mix? Straight alfalfa. Straight alfalfa. Yeah. I assume after the first year, I'm sure a little bit of grass will mm-hmm. just come naturally. 
then you could get away with the cheaper uh, forage sample of the RFV because RFV only takes legumes into account. Okay. The RFQ takes your grass grasses into account That's as well. Different. I learned something new. Thank you. So, but most most every farmer that I work with has a 50-50 or a 60-40 grass to alfalfa because they need it for grazing as well. So if you're just going straight alfalfa, being that your dairy farmers here um, are going to want it in baleage form for the most part, probably more than dry. Oh, good. Uh, I mean, believe me, if if you make dry cow hay, anybody can make dry cow hay, you're not going to make any money. But if you make high quality, dairy quality hay, it'll move. Mm-hmm. And there's money to be made there, but it's all about quality. Well, we'll just do the best we can. Mm-hmm. Yep. And if the windows, I've seen it so many times with hay, the last three, four years, if you get a small window in early May for your first cutting, it's amazing how there's that window every 30 days. And if you miss that window, now your first cutting quality went down, and now 30 days later, you don't have the same window. So it's it's kind of funny how if you are in the 28 to 32 inch or 32 day cut, how if you make it right the first cutting, how the other cuttings kind of seem to and that work might out. entail at the end of the season to have an actual fifth cutting rather than just a fourth. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. but then we have an extra cost of a pretty unique baler, and then we have an extra cost of the plastic wrap that goes around it. Mm-hmm. And I I still feel there's going to be a, a hard road to travel there trying to sell wet hay on a dry matter basis because it might confuse people on how it's dried down or how that mathematical equation works. But um, maybe I guess I'll just need to sample every field and have A&L labs. Or, sorry, I probably shouldn't say that. No. Uh, the local inspection company, the local lab service, dry it down and just present that every time I, I go to sell it. I think the best way to do it is get forage samples from every field. Every field. Okay. Every field, every, every field, cutting. Every cutting. And then you uh, you could actually talk to... I, we can put you in contact with all kinds of guys that raise hay and they base their price on an RFQ or an RFV plus an NEL, the net energy per lactation on those numbers. Hmm. You can come up with an equation that, and there's no dairy farmer that doesn't understand buying baleage on a dry matter basis. I mean, that's what they do because even like my brother buys semi loads in from uh, Minnesota or North Dakota and it, it comes in at maybe 20% moisture. So they bale it with just enough moisture to hold everything. So it almost wouldn't need to be wrapped, but it's also a storage thing. So he still buys that on a dry matter basis, even though it's very low moisture. Good to know. Oh. So one other thing I wanted to get into was you said earlier when you were talking about seed corn that part of your fertility program is your cover cropping. Um, so can you get into exactly what your program is and how you're building fertility through cover cropping? One thing I really like about double crop beans is not only the breakup of the weed cycle with another crop, but I also put the third crop in it. So when I plant my clover, I intercede it into my double crop beans. So double crop beans get cultivated on average two, most likely three times during their growing season, last time being at the end of August here. And that third pass, I have a special cultivator that has a blower cedar unit on it. So you're still going through killing weeds, but it meters it out based on gps it has a gps reader on it and it blows the seed meters it based on your speed of your tractor and then blows it down so right behind the cultivator shovel it blows a little mohawk a clover and i've I've wanted as a little mohawk because the first year i blew clover on double crop beans i i kept i was so excited about it i went out there every day and you know all the little seeds are starting to grow and it didn't take very long before the seeds that were directly in 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 the row of the soybean next to the stems they just kind of disappeared and i'm like huh wonder where they went and then uh, as the the week went on you'd see that disappearing zone grow out and out and then then the clover was big enough that I could actually see what was happening and it was getting choked out because it never got sun so by the time all that was said and done all I was left with was a little mohawk like about a three to four inch mohawk between my 30 inch rows of where the clover was actually big enough and strong enough to overwinter and make it to the next spring so I don't think it takes a rocket scientist, so why not just put all your clover right in that little four-inch band? And that really seems to work. I, I like it, but I've also noticed it works, a, it works a lot better. Actually, I'm trying to think if I have any double-crop beans that go east-west. 
I don't like doing that on east-west rows because the sun's further south in the horizon and as your beans grow, the sun won't actually hit that clover. So if you have an, a north-south planted bean field and you plant your clover between the rows, then you might get sunlight on that clover from, say, 10.30ish to 2, some 11 to 2, something like that. So at least it gets a 3 or 4 hour dose of good sunlight to keep growing and develop roots. And then with double crops, you don't really harvest them until around Christmas. So by then, it's ever the clover's uh, dormant and laying flat on the ground, so you clip your beans off. And then next spring, um, come usually about April 1st, you'll start seeing it into March. You'll see just a little bit of green life where your clover's at. And then by April 1st, you'll say, you know what, I think that's actually clover there. I think I might have some. And then by April 10th, you're like, hey, look at that. You can see green mohawks. And then by... Man, by April April 20th, some of the neighbors are scratching the heads like, what did, what did he do? Did he plant his field or something? <laughs> and sure enough, by the time, if you can last till the end of, uh, end of May, it just turns into a rainforest. And it's so beautiful. If you have crimson clover in it, that blooms a little bit sooner. Um, there's so many honeybees that just show up out of nowhere. And mm-hmm. it's, it's so neat. I, I like going out there in the evening and just sitting in my field, shutting everything off as far as I can and just... You'll hear this, and it's just, just crazy. Um, sorry, I got on a tangent there. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it completely canopies sometime around May 5th to 10th, where the clover, those four-inch bands of clover, are completely canopied and cover your whole field. And I got some cool pictures. Um, yeah, it's, it's neat. So when would you plow that down then? As late as the seed corn will let me, which okay. they like seeing it go under the end of May. I, if I can, I'd like to be, hold it on till probably the very beginning of June. Seed corn is a shorter season crop, so um, it still worked. Last year I didn't get to plow. We had a really wet spring, not this season, but last spring. And I didn't get to plow it until June 7th, I believe. And that was really awesome because even the medium red was in full bloom by then. The crimson was already, the whole field turned red and, and, and the seeds were made. And it was, it was terminated by then. Like the, it was in what, what mode comes after reproduction. Uh, I don't know, foliar growth and reproductive mode. But anyway, mm-hmm. the flowers are brown and dead. And uh, it was maximum nitrogen content. So that was a great year. This year, it was in probably solid red bloom but the medium red wasn't quite there yet i think i plowed may 26 this season Mm -hmm. and then when you moldboard plow do you fit the ground right away and plant or i like to level off right away then let it set and get at least two weed flushes through it first Mm -hmm. and then plant so with just light tillage twice yep Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's basically what my brother and brother-in-laws do as well but they farm with horses so they plant they plow earlier simply to because you know plowing takes a while it sure does and a lot of fuel Mm -hmm. well this is this has been really interesting i'm i'm i love when when people try new things like the the mohawk of clover i would never have thought about the beans completely shading that clover out I was thinking just blast it in the row and it'd be a solid mat in between but and then planting it north and south because of where the sun is this is really interesting you know you either farm for the chemical company or you farm for nature so when you're organic you just have to think kind of off the wall and think about all the different attributes to what it takes to make plants grow and uh as you stop plant spraying glyphosate i really truly believe your soil just transforms into something that it's never been before and as you continue with the organic trail, your mind kind of transforms into different offshoots and different things you can incorporate and try, and it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this was really interesting. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us. Awesome. I enjoyed it, too. My favorite thing to talk about is farming. Thanks a lot, Joel. Yep. See ya. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Back to the Roots Podcast. Brought to you by Albert Lee Seed.